And now you get to meet the ancient North Eurasians. The first time that I introduced you to them was when we were looking at this figure, where we had the basal Eurasians um, down in, um, in the Levant area, the Middle East, and we were talking about, at that point, focusing our attention on the populations that moved up north and to the west. So now we're going to turn our attention to north and east, those ancient North Eurasians. So as time was passing, and we were focusing our attention on the multiple migrations of people into peninsular Europe, simultaneously there was a lot going on over on this other side of the map. So the ancient North Eurasians were expanding their geographic range and establishing their own quite extensive cultural, uh, cultural adaptations to living that far north. So as I mentioned before, the ancient North Eurasians were essentially a mystery. We knew that they existed because there was evidence of them in the genetic, the nuclear DNA, the genetic variation of living populations, that there must have been a population living in this region that connected Northern Europeans with Native Americans. It wasn't until fairly recently that we got an even better sense of who these people were. And for this, I am going to take you all the way over to Lake Bakal up in Siberia in Russian. You can see it there in the upper right hand part of your screen. This is where we get our first clear insight, actual genetic evidence as to who the ancient North Eurasians were. Back in 2014, some ancient DNA was actually extracted from a skeleton that was recovered from the site of Malta. So Malta, like I mentioned, is near Lake Bakal in central Siberia. The site is composed of a series of subterranean houses made of large animal bones and a huge number of reindeer antlers. Remember, reindeer shed their antlers every year, and so you can go out and just pick them up and collect them. And it looks as though that's what these people were doing, and then using them to help build their, their subterranean houses. Their huts had likely been covered with animal skins and sod to protect them from the weather. And the people who lived at Malta they left behind expertly carved bone, ivory, and antler objects. Figurines of birds and human females are the most commonly found. As I mentioned, DNA was extracted from a skeleton found there. The skeleton were the, was the remains of a boy, and the boy was not 24,000 years old. He was still a boy when he died, but the remains date to a time period 24,000 years ago. So they extracted the DNA and compared his genomic variation with that of living people. And here's what they found. You're looking at an admixture map for the Malta boy here, um, and compared to 16 other complete human genomes. So remember, this was 2014, so in the world of genomics, this was a long time ago. So instead of looking at you know, 500 or 6,000 individuals, they were looking at 16 human genomes, which at the time was quite a lot of data. So let me orient, it, orient you onto this figure. So on the x-axis, you're looking at a drift parameter. Remember when in module 5, we were looking at those figures that gave you lines, and the orientation and the length of the lines gave you a sense of the genetic distance, the genetic difference between any two individuals, that's exactly what you're seeing here. It's just oriented a little bit differently, but the same basic concept. You'll notice down on the bottom of this graph that there's Denisova, and this is one of the, Den this is the Denisovan uh, DNA sequence. And then there are those 16 human genomes. MA1 is the the, the Malta skeleton, my highlight for that here. And the point of this graph is to notice that the Malta genome, MA1, is rooted in with the modern Europeans and that it shows, shows strong affinity to the Native Americans. 
let me walk you through this because that might not be immediately jumping out at you. So notice down below the x-axis that it has the color coding with the different ge major geographic regions where those people came from. You can see Africans in orange and they're the San, Buti, Yorba, and Dinka. You can see them up there at the, at the top of the figure. And then you have Europeans in blue. These are the Sardinians, French, Avar, and Mari. Indian from the um, from South and Central um, Asia, and then you have Papua uh, from Oceania, Oceania, and then there is um, Han there, East Asians in pink, two people there, and then Kirtiana, I think is how you pronounce that, down at the bottom. And so all of them form a clade that is distinct from um, Denisova, but notice MA1 is quite genetically divergent from all of those living people, but has a connection close to Mari and close to Kari, Karatani. Ah, Kari, Kari, Tiana. <laughs> Excuse me. It's hard sitting here under a blanket in my house trying to block noise. Anyway, okay, so maybe some of these, these different people are not all that familiar to you, so let me introduce you to uh, some of them, specifically the two that are most, have the, the most closest affinities to the Malta genome. Let's look at the, the Mari first. These are people found in the northern part of what is today Russia. Um, you can see a picture of them there. Let me show you um, on a map where they are. Here's the map, the satellite image we were looking at earlier, and you have Lake Bacal over in the upper right-hand side. And I've labeled the Caspian Sea, which is in the center, and then the Volga River, which is that major river system draining into the northern part of the Caspian Sea. The Mari people live up in this region, indicated by the yellow oval. So that's, as you can see, pretty far from Lake Bacal and where the Malta skeleton was found. Let's go back though. So you have uh, the, the Malta individual closely related to Mari and then also to the Karatiana people. These are an, indig an indigenous people who live in Brazil. Their reservation is located in the western part of the Amazon and today there's only about 320 individuals in this group. So all the way down in Brazil. But notice that that's actually the only individual that there is genome data for in this figure from Native Americans. So it's not necessarily that Malta was most closely related to people living in in South America, in the Amazon, but rather that this, this one individual is standing in to represent all of the Native Americans um, on a more global perspective. So Malta has this shared genetic affinity between these North Eurasians way on the other side of, of Russia, so getting over towards where you have um, Sweden and Norway and Finland um, and people living in the Western Hemisphere. So looking on this map that you've seen before with the ancestry clines as they existed before agriculture, so before 7,000 years ago, and then think about those people living in the northern, those far northern regions of Europe. So you have Norway, Sweden, Finland, um, then you can see the Volga River draining into the Caspian Sea. So above actually where they have these pie charts, placed on the map. That's where the Mari people exist, uh, live today. And then the Malta, uh, the Malta people and the boy, they would have been way over um, farther to the right hand side, the eastern part of that map. So we have then uh, evidence then of, of who those um, ancient North Eurasians were represented by that Malta individual. I want to add a little bit to this picture. So we have all of this genetic evidence, but let's add some archaeology to it. I'm going to introduce you to two sites. One is the Yana River site in northern Siberia. This is an amazing find. It represents a human year-round occupation that happened 31,600 years before today. 
And I'm also going to introduce you to Bluefish Cave, which is way up in northern Alaska. It's a hunting site dating to 28,000 years before present. Let's look at the Yana River site first. So here is where that's located, um, way towards the coast, but with, when sea levels were lower, it wouldn't have been um, it wouldn't have been right on the coast. It's the sediment, the eh, not sediments, the archaeological remains, uh, materials are found eroding out of a bend in the Yana River. We plotted on this map here, the sketch. And the, the archaeology is just spectacular. You have these nice stone tools, you have wooden artifacts, and they know that it was a year-round occupation because it, they had a lot of household items like needles there as well. You don't find those in more episodically occupied sites such as Bluefish Caves. Bluefish Caves is quite different in terms of the tools that have been recovered from that site, um, quite different from the Yana River site because it mostly looks like it was a hunting site where people would go up, um, spend just maybe maybe a week, a couple of weeks or so, um, work on their stone tools, sharpen everything up, and then go hunting. So 28,000 years ago. So can you remember the dates for the last glacial maximum? Yeah. So the last glacial maximum is around 20. 28,000 years ago until about maybe 15,000 years ago. Right, so Bluefish Caves is actually kind of right before the last glacial, glacial maximum really started taking off and becoming cooler and kicking in. And the Yana River site was before the last glacial maximum as well. So it indicates that these people were occupying this region that far north at that high of a latitude before, just before the last glacial maximum, last just before that last ice age. Well, let's add a little more data to this. I'm going to pull in some more ancient DNA for you now. So since that, since that study in 2014 of the Malta skeleton, 34 more ancient genomes have been sequenced, dating between 31,000 years ago and 600 years ago. And this was a big study that was published in the summer of 2019. We've looked at some of that data already, actually. And just to give you a sense of how fast this field is moving, if you did a PubMed search for research papers published on ancient DNA in human and human that were published just in the last year, you get 237. So this, this field moves really fast. As I, as I mentioned previously, it's, it's a very new science and very exploratory, and it will, it will settle and become more of a hypothesis-driven science, maybe in about five, ten years or so. But let's look at a little bit more of that evidence. Because as you start pulling it all together, what it indicates really strongly is that people lived all across the subarctic and the Arctic region before the last glacial maximum. It gives you a sense here of where some of those ancient um, genomes were recovered from. So sites at 45,000 years, 40,000 years old, Malta, we just talked about it, 24,000 years old, the Yana River site at about 32,000 years. So these are just just some of the pieces of evidence that we have for this extensive, extensive cultural group um, and, and genetically similar group of people who lived all across this Arctic and subarctic region. So tyranny of the present, forget today, uh, because if you go back before the last glacial maximum, this was a tremendously uh, rich, cultural and populated place in the world all across going from um, Norway all the way through to um, this this far tip of Siberia and while we don't see that that those peoples anywhere near to the degree today as they likely existed back then we do see evidence of those ancient North Eurasians preserved in the DNA of living people. As you can see on this map here, with the little dots represent uh, the, the um, 
different samples and how much genetic affinity they have with these ancient North Eurasian ancestry. These are modern populations and this is the, the degree of ancestry they have with the ancient North Eurasians. And you can see that far north is the farther north you go into northern Europe and across that you have you have representation of those ancient North Eurasians. And now we're going to close down this video and I want to focus for our next video on just the population, a subpopulation of those ancient North Eurasians and what happened to them during the last glacial maximum. See you on the other side.